Professor Sorokin has proposed the idea of love energy, which we must accumulate if life in the, on this planet is to continue. Unfortunately, as he points out, we know much less about love energy than about the energy of heat or light or electricity or other forms of physical energy. I'm not sure whether he's using his conception of energy merely as a metaphor or whether he really thinks of a kind of love crombe in which something far more potent than nuclear energy can be generated. But he finds it possible to talk about the production, the accumulation or loss, the generating, transmission and distribution of the energy of love. Sarukin has laid down a regular program for the stepping up of the production of love energy almost as if there was to be a five-year plan for its increase. The first thing he says is to increase the number of the exceptional apostles of love. How that is to be done, he doesn't tell us. We can hardly put up a proposal for a new Vinobhaji and obtain financial sanction from the ministry. <laughs> but in any case, the love produced by these great men is not enough. It must be paralleled by at least a modest increase in love generation by ordinary people. Nothing greatly heroic, says Sorokin, can or need be expected from the rank and file, either in increased output or the quality of love generated. And he lays down a simple program for what he calls the modest elevation of the behavior of mortals. If, for example, they would just abstain from killing other people in war, if they would cut in half their daily output of hate and double that of their daily output of love, it would be enough to change the world. The essential thing is to increase the love output and decrease the hate of production on an enormous scale in every country. I do not think, however, that we should despise what I may call the proletariat of love. I myself have found some of the most beautiful examples of compassionate love in huts where poor men lie, among unnoticed, forgotten people. I remember 20 years ago a beautiful girl who was married to an elderly and terribly deformed leper. She was a tribal Pardan of central India. Many young men desired her for her beauty, and no one would have thought the worse of her if she had left her husband and gone to seek happiness elsewhere. But with the most touching devotion and love, she stayed with the old man, tending his sores, bearing with his natural ill temper, until he died, and soon afterwards she followed him, for by then she herself had been affected by the disease. I've also found in the little homes of Buddhist tribesmen along our northeastern frontier the most beautiful spirit of hospitality, charity and affection. In a month's tour that my wife and I made to Tawang, the great monastery on the borders of India, we didn't hear a child crying on one single occasion. The protective power of love in the family, love even towards a stranger, was a reflection of the great love of mankind symbolized in the Buddhist compass. Indeed, it is a com commonplace that the ordinary people of the world are not interested in war or the quarrels of politicians. And in the 30 years that I have spent among very simple tribal people, in spite of occasional quarrels or rebellions, it's this fundamental interest of theirs in love that has most impressed me. And so, we must accumulate the energies of love and pour them out on everything that threatens hatred. In the home, the factory, the streets of our cities, wherever it may be, only the nuclear fundamental energy of love can provide the setting for a solution of disputes. Now the idea of love as a healing and creative force is as old as Buddhism and the Greek philosophers. In the Symposium, Plato describes love as the healer of the ills, which are the great impediment to the happiness of the race. 
the miracles of Jesus when he cured the leper and restored sight to the blind may well be acted parables of the healing power of love. The Buddhists, too, taught that love was the best physician. The law of the wheel is love. It is the law of laws, eternal harmony. All who love are healers of those who are in need of it. Now, when I speak of the healing power of love, I'm not thinking of faith healing or miraculous cures of any kind. I'm thinking rather of the power of love that uses the hands of doctor or nurse and the techniques of modern medicine. Dr. Schweitzer, for example, gives a classic account of the way a doctor's love can inspire both himself and his patient. He is living in the equatorial forest of Africa, and a poor African is brought to him with a strangulated hernia. It is not only a matter of saving his life, but as the doctor says, I can save him from days of torture. That is what as I feel as my great and ever new privilege. Pain is a more terrible lord of mankind than even death himself. When the poor moaning creature is brought to him, he lays his hand on his forehead and says, don't be afraid. In an hour's time you shall be put to sleep, and when you wake, you won't feel any more pain. Very soon the patient has his anaesthetic, the operation is performed, and then a Schweitzer continues the story. In the hardly lighted dormitory, I watch for the sick man's awaking. Scarcely has he recovered his consciousness when he stares about him and ejac ejaculates again and again, I have no more pain, I have no more pain. There's a remarkable poem by James Kirkup called A Correct Compassion, which describes a great surgeon performing a mitral stenosis valvulotomy operation. It stresses the same point, the power of an imaginative dexterity and the knowledge and technique gained by hundreds of years of devoted research, which is surely one aspect of love. With proper grace, in forming a correct compassion, that performs its love and makes it live. Sorokin, in fact, points out that the psychosomatic medicine of today regards any strong emotional disturbance as dangerous. And this is especially true of hatred and jealousy. For the combination in a person of too little love with too much hate <coughs> is largely responsible for many diseases. He quotes the anatomist John Hunter who suffered from angina pectoris, as saying, my life is at the mercy of any rascal who makes me angry. <laughs> Love, on the other hand, will prevent and cure many diseases. Sorokin makes even stronger claims for the power of love. The life-giving and sustaining power of love, he says, is strikingly demonstrated by the fact of suicide. We know now that the main cause of suicide is psychosocial isolation of the individual, his state of being lonely in the home and human universe, not loving or caring for anybody and not being loved by anybody. Each time when the love ties of a person are breaking down, when he becomes an unattached human atom in the universe, his chances of suicide are increasing. Each time that his love and attachment to his fellow men multiply and grow stronger, the chances for suicide are decreasing. This means that love is indeed the intensest vital force, <coughs> the central core of life itself. And most of us, in fact, know how the presence of a loved person by one's bedside in time of sickness can do much to assist recovery. And the doctor or the nurse who treats patients with affection creates an atmosphere in which the process of cure is accelerated. Particularly in the remote tribal areas to which the healing hand of modern medicine is only just being extended, those doctors who go to the people in the spirit of love and compassion quickly break down the barriers of suspicion, attract people to come to them, 
and by their affection stimulate the will to live, which is sometimes half the cure. And yet again Sorokin, but on less certain ground, claims that love energy contributes to the prolongation of human life. He's analyzed some 3,500 Christian saints and concludes that they had a notably longer life duration than their unsaintly contemporaries. This sounds very good and I'd like to accept it, but I'm very doubtful if it's really true. <laughs> Sorokin bases his conclusions on the ages of those who died in the United States in the year 1920. But although he finds a definitely higher figure among the saints who lived up to 80 and above, there's very little difference in the average age of death up to that time. In any case, the causes of death are so manifold that it seems impossible to generalize, and the ages of saints in the old days were largely speculative. It's obviously reasonable, I suppose, to expect that a good man who keeps his temper and whose blood pressure is not affected by hatred and jealousy will live longer than someone who's dominated by angry and disturbing passions. But unfortunately, or perhaps even fortunately for most of us who are not saints, it doesn't always work out like that. Those whom God loves die young, and some of the greatest rascals in history have survived to a ripe old age. <laughs> Shakespeare, however, regards love as the defier of time. He writes that love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Here the poet is thinking of the love between two human beings and he stresses the existence of something unchangeable in a world of change. He protests that in spite of all changing and all deluding time, he will remain true to the marriage of true minds, which is love, which is alone eternal in this realm of change and illusion. John Donne also says, all other things to their destruction draw, only our love hath no decay. This no tomorrow hath nor yesterday. Running, it never runs from us away, but truly keeps his first, last, everlasting day. And another minor poet, William Cartwright, says, Love makes those young whom age doth chill, and, when he fi and whom he finds young keeps young still. Well, this we may say is only poetry if there is such a thing as only poetry. Yet in our own experience, love does promote vitality. To love and be loved makes life so much more worth living that it promotes the will to live. Love really does keep us young. And here is a real message of hope. Love is difficult, but it is not impossible. It can help to banish specific diseases, it is a cure for insanity, it checks the tendency to suicide. Hatred, envy, jealousy, anxiety, guilt, these are things which even if they do not cause disease directly, at least create an atmosphere which makes those who suffer from them more likely to fall ill. In fact, they themselves are diseases. On the other hand, love and all the beautiful things that come from it not only make suffering bearable, and can bring out of distress the possibility of spiritual growth, but may actually serve as a healing agency. Now we come to the power of love in charity. The giving of alms has always been regarded as a practical token of love in action. But charity, in the Victorian sense, has almost disappeared in the context of a welfare state. The Bible tells us to give one-tenth of our income to the poor, but today a far higher percentage than that is taken from us by the income tax collector. <laughs> and that means that the state, if we can bring ourselves to look at it ideally, which we ought to do, has become the expression of love through social justice. 
and no longer leaves it to the individual to indulge in indiscriminate charity. Even in the old days, there was a proverb, cold as charity, and a great deal of the relief given to the poor can hardly be claimed to be, have been an expression of love. Love enters in when the service of the poor is regarded as an act of worship. The classical expression of this idea is found in the famous parable of the sheep and the goats, the inner's much parable, which Tolstoy used rather charmingly in one of his short stories. There was an old Russian cobbler called Martin who dreamt one night that Christ would visit his shop the following day. He took his dream very seriously and got everything ready for his divine visitor. But the hours passed and no one came except a few poor people. One was an old man whom Martin fed and provided with a warm coat. Another was a young mother and her baby to whom he gave food and cloth. Then a woman selling apples and a street urchin came in quarrelling and Martin made peace between them. But there wasn't any sign at all of Christ and by nightfall the old man was feeling very disappointed and blaming himself for taking his dream seriously. But suddenly a voice called his name and he saw a glow of light in a corner of the room into which there stepped in turn the old man, the mother and child and the woman and the little boy. Each of them smiled and said to Martin, do you not know me? And vanished. Then Martin remembered the great saying, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. This idea was greatly developed by Gandhiji in his thought of the God of the poor, Daridra Narayan. Of all the names of God, he says, the Rindra Narayan is the most sacred. And he says elsewhere that God dwells among the poor as they cling to him as their sole refuge and shelter. To serve the poor is therefore to serve him. And again, there is no worship purer or more pleasing to God than selfless service of the poor. Gandhiji went even further than this. His love for the poor and particularly for the untouchables expressed itself in an identification with them and their interests. He wasn't content to attack untouchability. He must himself become an untouchable. Do not call me a Mahatma, he would say. I am a bhangi, a sweeper, an outcast. His identification with the poor, partly through his own poverty, but essentially because of his intense love for them, was something quite different from the calculated charity of the modern organized world. We come now to the idea of reverence for life, a conception through which Dr. Albert Schweitzer has reminded the modern world of what the ancient sages of the East have taught for centuries. In the summer of 1915, the great scholar Dr was travelling slowly along one of Africa's desolate rivers and was trying desperately to solve the problems of existence. One evening at sunset, as his boat was making its way through a herd of hippopotamuses, of all things, there flashed upon his mind, unforeseen and unsought, the phrase, reverence for life. The iron door had yielded. The path in the thicket had become visible. Now I knew that the world view of ethical life affirmation, together with its ideals of civilization, is founded in thought. From that day onwards, Schweitzer moved among all the problems of life with greater assurance. He had discovered the meaning of universal love. Ethics are pity. All life is suffering. The will to live, which has attained to knowledge, is therefore seized with deep pity for all creatures. It experiences not only the woe of mankind, but that of all creatures with it. What is called in ordinary ethics love is in its real essence pity, or better, I think, compassion. In this powerful feeling of compassion, 
the will to live is diverted from itself, its purification begins. All life then became sacred to Schweitzer, though he had to face, as Gandhiji had to face, many difficult problems. He had compassion even for the palm trees, which had to be cut down to build his hospital. Whenever the pillar of a house was lowered into its pit, he looked to see whether any ants or toads or other creatures had fallen into it. And if so, he used to remove them with his own hands. Yet, as a doctor and surgeon, he describes himself as a mass murderer of bacteria. And he has always carried on a ceaseless and determined war against mosquitoes and spiders and scorpions and snakes and other creatures that endanger human life. Yet this same man goes out of his way to lift a parched earthworm from the dust and put it safely in the grass, or stoops to rescue a struggling insect from a puddle. He won't even tear leaves from a tree or pluck flowers. He has extended the principle of life, of reverence for life, beyond the realm of animal, bird, fish and insect, to the humblest forms of the vegetable creation and even to forms of beauty that are inanimate. The Buddhist scriptures teach the same great doctrine. As a mother, even at the risk of her own life, protects her son, so let a man cultivate goodwill without measure towards all beings. Let him practice unhindered love and friendliness towards the whole world, above, below, around. Dostoevsky, too, urged people to love all God's creation, the whole and every grain of sand in it. Love every leaf, every ray of God's light. Love the animals, love the plants, love everything. If you love everything, you will perceive the divine mystery in things. Once you perceive it, you will begin to comprehend it better every day, and you will come at last to love the whole world, with an all-embracing love. This is something much greater than sympathy, which may be only emotional or intellectual. Reverence for life, on the other hand, is love in action. It includes fellowship in suffering, in joy and in effort. It includes feeling as one's own all the circumstances and all the aspirations of the will to live, its pleasures too and its longing to live itself out to the full, as well as its urge to self-perfection. We have already seen, and I'll turn now to a, thought of, a few thoughts about love and the tribal people. We've already seen how a program of love must include the poorest and most oppressed. The whole world offers us objects for love, and India, too, still has many millions who demand our affectionate concern. Samuel Johnson once said that a man should take care not to be made a proverb and therefore should avoid having any one topic of which people can say we shall hear him upon it. I'm afraid I myself have become rather a proverb <laughs> because I, I can't keep away from the tribal people for long. In dealing with the tribes, and especially those who have had little to do with the outside world, such as those living among our frontier mountains, we have to act in a very special spirit of love. They are confused and disturbed by the sudden inroads of what we call civilization, and sometimes they are naturally suspicious, overwhelmed by our technological superiority. <coughs> sometimes resentful even of our best intention schemes for their welfare. The success of our plans depends very largely on the spirit in which we approach them. We are spending vast sums of money on their welfare and we will be spending much more during the third and fourth five-year plans. If the officials or social workers among them are dominated not by the spirit of condescension or patronage, but by a deep affection. This will be for the people's good, and we will avoid the danger of causing them the psychological injury 
that has often befallen primitive folk who have been introduced rapidly or in the wrong way to the stresses of the modern world. We have seen that humility is a mark of love and anyone who works with the tribal people must be sincerely humble and even the most important official must look on his tribal brethren as one with himself and equal to him. Any superiority or pride in dealing with them will immediately defeat the benefits of development. We've seen that love at its highest does not impose its own will on others. And this is why Mr. Nero has said, as the tribal people should develop along the lines of their own genius, and we should avoid imposing anything on them. That is the way of love. Then again, love has reverence and even admiration for the objects of it lo its love. And there are in fact many things of beauty in the tribal outlook and way of living, which love will recognize and do everything possible to foster. Similarly, love will approach tribal religion with the same respect that it will give to the great historical religions. It will honor the good traditions which have endured for many centuries and will do nothing to create in the people a sense of inferiority by criticizing or mocking their religion, their social institutions, and their way of dress or their recreations. Love is very practical and expresses itself in definite material ways for the good of those to whom it gives its affection. The great section 46 of the Constitution of India seems to me to breathe the very spirit of love. The state shall promote with special care the educational and economic interests of the weaker sections of the people, and in particular of the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes, and shall protect them from social injustice and all forms of exploitation. I think we should all be very proud of Section 46. There are other less romantic sections in the Constitution which provide <laughs> financial assistance and make administrative provisions for the welfare of the tribes. These also, though they may seem at first sight rather dull, express, do express the affection of India's people for their neglected brethren. Happy are those who can live in the mountains and forests of India among the tribal people. For although they may have to face many hardships, they have the inexpressible joy of caring for them by countless acts of kindness. The thinkers, the planners, the administrators who have to live far away in a secretariat have a harder task. They don't have this immediate satisfaction. But they also are equally inspired by a kind of love. Gandhiji once said that a himsa or love makes exploitation impossible. And perhaps the greatest danger to the tribes is not cultural destruction, but economic exploitation. They have lost, and still are losing, vast areas of their land. Millions of them are in bondage to the moneylenders. Many have been reduced almost to the condition of serfs. The great industrial projects inevitably lead to the dispossession of their traditional lands. And the task of rehabilitation has not always been implemented properly. If, therefore, India would fulfill the ideals of her constitution, it is essential that state by state and district by district, every form of exploitation should be eliminated by releasing the energies of love and compassion. When the dry bones of development are inspired and made to glow by affection, the tribal people will respond. They desire change, and change is inevitable for them. Let us ensure that it is along the pathway of love that they will advance towards a brighter future. But this doesn't apply only to the tribal areas. It was discovered as long ago as the time of King Ashok that love was a vital element in government. 
We have long since drifted away from this ideal. But today, at least in India, the old imperial or colonial concept of administration, which kept rulers and ruled at a distance from each other, and considered it improper for f officials to be too friendly with ordinary people, has gone, or should go. Sardar Vallabhai Patel was essentially a great administrator, and the new philosophy of government, which he and other leaders introduced, ideally based on Gandhiji's Ahimsa, has brought love, though we don't usually speak in those, these terms, you may say it's very idealistic to say so, tried to bring love into administration, lessen the, the gulf between rulers and ruled, and stripped officialdom of its arrogance and pomp. The Panchayati Raj and the cooperative movement are active expressions of this new administrative friendliness and equality. And another sector where a program of love needs greater emphasis than hitherto is in our ideas of punishment, our attitude towards the anti-social elements among us, and our treatment of criminals. When compassionate love inspires our prisons, Gandhiji's ideal for them will be fulfilled. They will no longer be the expression of society's indignation against those who ignore or defy it. We will not want to revenge ourselves on the criminal, but to cure him, and the prison will become a sort of hospital where he will be healed. And now we come to the vexed problem of love and violence. Violence and all its hateful panoply, war, oppression of the weak, cruelty, genocide, inquisition, persecution of the heretic, political or social or religious. Violence is a supreme enemy of love. Personal hatred and jealousy may be more immediately disturbing to the individual, but it is only in rare cases that they lead to disastrous action. War, on the other hand, even though it may bind fellow soldiers together in a temporary brotherhood, creates a world of enemies and turns whole nations and continents against each other. Today we have at last become really frightened of it because of the appalling danger of modern nuclear warfare. But even now the stress is generally more on the fear of war than on the love of peace. Every religion has preached against violence and adherents of every religion have forgotten the teaching to which they gave lip service. Yet the protest has persisted throughout the centuries. Dr. Schweitzer has recalled that over 2,000 years ago, it was said of certain Chinese travelers who went about spreading the message of peace, that they sought to unite men through an ardent love in universal brotherhood. When they were reviled, they did not consider it a shame. They were intent on nothing but the redemption of men from quarreling. They forbade aggression and preached disarmament in order to redeem mankind from war. This teaching they carried throughout the world. The world was not ready to accept their teaching, but they held to it all the more firmly. Jesus frequently preached the importance of not only tolerating, but actually loving our enemies. Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who treat you spitefully, treat others as you would like them to treat you. The early Christians were undoubtedly pacifists, and this was one of the things that brought them into conflict with the Roman Empire. An early Christian theologian, Tertullian, asked, can it be lawful to handle the sword? when the Lord himself has declared that he who uses the sword shall perish by it. And he said again, the Lord by his disarming of Peter disarmed every soldier from that time forward. And many other Christian leaders of the time spoke in the same way. But this meant that it was impossible for Christianity to become a state religion. And as this essentially revolutionary face gradually grew more respectable, 
and finally became part of the settled order. The old antagonism to war was given up. And it is very strange to reflect that it was St. Augustine, one of the greatest lovers of history, one of the most eloquent praisers of love, was perhaps the chief exponent of the doctrine that war was not incompatible with the teachings of Jesus. I needn't go into his arguments here, except to note that he does make the condition that a war must be a just war, and a soldier must be fully authorized for what he does. Buddhism has been more consistent, and the Dhammapada points out the uselessness of war because both sides lose. Victory breeds hatred, for the conquered is unhappy. He who has given up both victory and defeat is contented and happy. And the same treatise continually stresses that hatred does not cease by hatred at any time. Hatred ceases by love. This is an eternal law. Let a man overcome anger by love. Let him overcome evil by good. The way of happiness is to live among those who hate us without hating them. Then Schweitzer, to quote him yet again, has analyzed the reason for war and how to overcome it. Today, there is an absence of thinking which is characterized by a contempt for life. We waged war for questions which through reason might have been solved. No one won. The war killed millions of men, brought suffering to millions of men, and brought suffering and death to millions of innocent animals. Why? Because we did not possess the highest rationality of reverence for life. And because we do not yet possess this, every people is afraid of every other, and each causes fear to the others. There is no other remedy than reverence for life, and at that we must arrive. We may admit that we cannot love our enemies to order, but we can train ourselves by conditioning our hearts and minds to love. The Buddhist scriptures again and again suggest a method of meditation whereby we may extend our feelings of love to all the world. They tell us to think in imagination of each quarter of the globe in turn and to suffuse it, to send out from ourselves a wave of friendliness a mind of friendliness that is far-reaching, widespread, immeasurable, without enmity, without malevolence, and to send this to north, east, south, and west in turn, and to do it every day. Well, if this love is to be broadcast to all men in that way, it must be built in as a quality of the mind, for only in this way will it become a habitual attitude sort of attitude you find among ordinary people in Thailand, uh, where they welcome you with the affectionate greeting, may you be happy. Gandhiji says that a man who believes in the efficacy of the doctrine of Ahimsa finds in the ultimate stage when he's about to reach the goal that the whole world is at his feet. If you express your love in such a manner that it impresses itself indelibly upon your so-called enemy, he must return it. Gandhiji thought of India as a great Pacific force in the world and based the practicality of this on a correct understanding of patriotism. He declared that his patriotism was not an exclusive thing. It is all embracing and I should reject that patriotism which sought to mount upon the distress or the exploitation of other nationalities. The conception of my patriotism is nothing if it is not always, in every case without exception, consistent with the broadest good of humanity at large. He had no desire to isolate India from the rest of the world. Interdependence is and ought to be as much as the, uh, the ideal of man as self-sufficiency. His mission was not merely the brotherhood of Indian humanity, not merely the freedom of India. Through realization of this freedom, he hoped to realize and carry on the mission of the brotherhood of man. Our nationalism can be no peril to other nations, inasmuch as we will exploit none, just as we will allow none to exploit us. <coughs> Through Swaraj, 
we would serve the whole world. It's been pointed out that the theoretical ideal of the Vedantin, to be one with all that lives, became a practical reality to Gandhiji. My religion and my patriotism, derived from my religion, embrace all life. I want to realize brotherhood or identity, not merely with the beings called human, but I want to realize identity with all life, even with such beings as crawl on earth. What to the metaphysician is a triumph of intellectual subtlety, was to Gandhiji a supreme adventure of the heart and mind. His love was a reasoned love. It was no sentiment or emotion. It was the fruit of hard thinking. It was, in fact, a part of truth. Hence, there were no perils to his universalism. It was as strong as truth itself. Gandhiji was universal because he had put his selfhood to death. From the funeral pyre of individualism, there rose the triumph of universal love. He hoped that this triumph would mean that it would be the privilege of the ancient land of India to show the way out of war and blood spilling to the hungering world. If we are to banish violence, we must fight it with our brains, not simply with our emotions or our fears. And this is why a philosophy of love, which I have dared to call a philosophy, though I am no philosopher, is so important. Thomas Hobbes used to say that the first and most fundamental law of nature was to seek peace and follow it. It's very important that we should not assume that violence, jealousy, rivalry, fear and hatred are natural things, part of our emotional and mental makeup, things that we can't help and so inevitable in the lives of men and nations. We are men. And as men, we are made for love and goodness, truth and peace. These are the natural things, the really human things. And it must be surely a matter of great pride to us all that India, who has always cherished these precious human values and whose heart is gentle, loving and tolerant, should, through the efforts of our leaders in the councils of the world, have been making so strong a contribution to world peace. Gandhiji used to insist that ahimsa must begin in the individual heart and extend out to embrace the entire world. He would never accept the position that love was a merely domestic virtue. It must control the policies and politics of nations. Peace is not a sentiment. If it is to live, it must be founded in the intelligence. There must be a reason for it. One of the great enemies to peace is the false concept of race, which has for so long dominated mankind. A few years ago, UNESCO issued a fine statement on this subject, the work of some of the leading biologists and anthropologists of the world. Scientists, it declared, have reached general agreement in recognizing that mankind is one, that all men belong to the same species, Homo sapiens. It is further generally agreed among them that all men are probably derived from the same stock and that the genes that differentiate them are few in comparison with the vast number common to all human beings, regardless of the populations to which they belong. This means that the likenesses among men are far greater than their differences. The biological fact of race and the myth of race should be distinguished. For all practical social purposes, race is not so much a biological phenomenon as a social myth. A recently published book has described race as man's most dangerous fallacy, a fallacy that has caused an enormous amount of human and social damage. In recent years, it has taken a heavy toll in human lives and caused untold suffering. It still prevents the normal development of millions of human beings and deprives civilization of the effective cooperation of productive minds. Biological and sociological studies further lend support to the ethic of universal brotherhood. For man is born with drives towards cooperation 
and unless these drives are satisfied, man and nation alike fall ill. Man is born a social being who can reach his fullest development only through interaction with his fellows. The denial at any point of this social bond between man and man brings with it disintegration. In this sense, every man is his brother's keeper. Here there is some sort of intellectual basis for world peace and love. I needn't elaborate the sorrows and tragedies that have been brought upon the world by a false anthropology. The doctrine of one master race in Europe plunged us into the most destructive of all wars. The doctrine of a racial superiority based on colour is dying but still exerts its evil influence in some parts of the world and may yet lead to disaster. The gospel of man's fundamental oneness is destroying the power of this bad thing and one day we must hope and believe will lead us all into the peace and security of the world state. We must always remember that in one sense every war is a civil war. All strife between men is a domestic strife. There is only one nation, one race, one family. We all belong to the nation, the race, the family of humanity. <laughs> now love is broad and deep as life itself and I've only been able to touch the fringe of the subject and have had to ignore altogether many of its aspects. Love is the mainspring of all religions. I haven't been able to expound them all. Some of you will be able to think of many quotations which I might have included or points that I might have made. But you must forgive me for my omissions, for a year's course of lectures would not suffice to exhaust this beautiful and majestic theme. Love cannot be defined, but equally it cannot be mistaken. It takes an endless variety of forms, and religious people have gone to great pains to decide which of them is the better. I feel, however, that we needn't be too particular about this. In a world where so much is darkened by hatred, revenge, pride and competition, let us have any kind of love as long as it's love. The highest love, I agree with the philosophers, is the self-disregarding movement of the soul towards another person and then to an ever-widening circle which includes all creation and God himself. We are human beings. <coughs> And in our human weakness, we may not achieve all that. Yet we must do what we can. Love has its dangers. In the family or in friendship, possessive love can be as harmful as no love at all. Possessiveness, although clothed in the fair garments of love, is really its denial, for it seeks to impose on someone else. Jealousy is often a byproduct of love. Yet it also is a form of imposition, for it is self-centeredness carried to the highest degree. Sentimentality is a less harmful type of love gone wrong, but it is sometimes actually deters love by its unmanly softness. No one has expressed these dangers better than the poet William Blake. I cry, love, love, love. Happy, happy love free as the mountain wind. Can that be love that drinks another as a sponge drinks water, that clouds with jealousy his nights, with weepings all the day, to spin a web of age around him, grey and hoary, dark, till his eyes sicken at the fruit that hangs before his sight. Such is self-love that envies all, a creeping skeleton, with lamp-like eyes watching around the frozen marriage bed. The devout seeker, says Kabir, is he who mingles in his heart the double currents of love and detachment, like the mingling of the streams of Ganges and Jamuna. For love disturbs the soul, yet at the same time equips and inspires it for its journey to eternity. Buddhist and yogi alike aim at a serenity in which love may be a distraction 
that they can't reach it without love. On the other hand, they cannot mm, reach love without serenity, for a life of gentleness and universal kindness, which brings peace of heart, is the ideal setting for love. India, throughout its history, which has been assailed so often by external forces inimical to love, has in its metaphysics, its social customs, and the temperament of its people always been dominated by love. It has believed that all life is sacred, and among its ideals are those of ahimsa, which will cause no injury, karuna, which has compassion on all beings, and maitri, which gives itself in practical love and charity. The love deep in its heart has made men tolerant and liberal towards the beliefs and customs of others. It has inspired its people with a desire for integration and harmony. The future of India depends on the degree to which its traditional love energy can continue to dominate its civilization. It is only through love that all the diversities of language, race and custom can be transcended. Sardar Vallabhai Patel's greatest task was the integration of India. Integration is simply love interpreted in national and political terms. Love seeketh not her own, and as the many children of the one mother learn the great lessons of love and practice them, the barriers to integration are bound to fall and disappear. The same love that brings peace between the nations brings unity within the nation. Along with love, there must be faith in India's historic mission to the world, which is so great that once it is truly realized, regional jealousies and cultural rivalries become insignificant. India's is, in fact, the gospel of a wide-hearted and liberal love for all men, the message of true internationalism and universal peace that must ultimately lead to a world civilization, which we will only achieve when man rises to his true stature through love. Love illuminates knowledge. It gives meaning to beauty. It is the heart of virtue. It is the dearest guest of the whole. Love's great artillery is more powerful than the weapons of hatred. And properly directed, can overcome them. Love gives dignity and stature to every man. It chastens the proud and redeems the sad, the guilty and the ashamed, and gives to the poorest a meaning and reason for life. It is, as Traherne said, the most delightful and natural employment of the soul of man. It is indeed natural, for man is born, he exists to cooperate to live in harmony with his fellows, not to compete or conflict with them. This is what is to be fully human, for when man is brought by love to realize his part in the life of the whole world, he no longer is open to the isolating power of loneliness. His personality is expanded to a sense of unity with the universal. Love brings him freedom from fear. It brings him peace and fills his soul with a gentle power that will reunite conflicting forces. Sardar Vallabhai Patel was one of the greatest agents of the unity of India, and we cannot show our loyalty to his memory better than by extending the tender energies of love to achieve the full and perfect integration of the country he loved so well.